So if you don't have a twang, you need to grow in Jesus. <laughs> Jesus and Paul, I believe, both were Texan. Um, you can tell when you read the King James Version of the Bible that ye all should, uh, should listen to what the Spirit of the Lord has to say to you. So this is, uh, this is an opportunity for you to uh, grill us. Um, anything that is in your heart that you'd like to know, uh, there's, there's no rules. Uh, any question is legit. You've probably heard the statement, um, the only stupid question is the one that's not asked. Um, so if there's something that you want to know um, about us personally, um, about um, marriage, family, about the doctrines of, of the scriptures, uh, we are... Uh, we're versed in all of those things. Um, as the the president, I've never officially announced this, and so if this catches you off guard, then just deal with it. But um, as the president of Steve Castle Ministries, a parachurch ministry that I started with Mitchell's help, um, one of the titles that the Lord gave me, um, a little tagline for Steve Castle Ministries, was a specialist in the king and the kingdom. And when he first said that to me, I'm like, I am, that would be the most arrogant thing that I could ever say. Lord, I'm not putting that on my stuff. He said, well, you can either be what I call you, or you can be what you call you. You, you would think it's like a really humble thing to argue with God about him calling you. But I'll guarantee nearly everybody in the room does the same thing. That God calls you something, and you're going to argue with him about what you really are. And he said that you had spent, um, I was born again when I was five years old, and I was baptized in the Holy Spirit at five years old. Mm. Praying in other tongues, uh, tongues of interpretation at five years old. It was probably hilarious. My mom probably, <laughs> I'm sure the church was like, okay. Um, but anyway, I've been, I've been in the scriptures and um, in the heart of God since I was five years old. Barring a couple of <laughs> spiritual comatose states, um, and when I thought about it, the Lord said, you know, you're, uh, there's a reality to the fact that you know some things. And if you don't believe that you know some things, how in the world is anybody ever going to believe that you know some things if you don't believe in you? I just, I just, multiple times in the last two weeks, I've had this conversation with someone. I said, if you don't believe in you, how in the world is anybody else going to believe in you? You're going to ask someone to do something you don't do? And I'll be honest, a lot of folks don't believe in themselves. It's called insecurity. The only way insecurity can exist in you is because you're not secure in Jesus. Because he is the anchor of your soul. So if you are insecure, and I know there are folks in here, and I'm not calling you out or nothing, but there's a gaggle of folks just in Christianity as a, as a whole, because a lot of the reasons that people come to Christianity and they come to Christ is because they realize their brokenness. But what they do then is when they come to Christ, they still believe in this broken thing that needs to connect them to him, and they don't realize that you came to him broken so that he could make you the way you were supposed to be, which is unbroken. So if you're insecure, if you're struggling with things about who you are and what you're called to do and whether you really truly have the ability or the grace or the, or the giftings or the talent, I'll just tell you, you don't. You, you, you absolutely suck at life. So Jesus died for you so you could die so he could give you his life because he really rocked it. When it came to life, Jesus rocked it. And so he wants to give you his life because you suck at your life. Right. <laughs> and be okay with that. It's totally okay. Now, if that offends you, like, well, I don't suck at life. We probably need to have a meet. Because I need to tell you how bad, 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 bad you are as an individual. That you were born into sin. That you were born into darkness. That you don't have a clue. And your God is the devil. That I knew I wasn't going to get a rousing ovation on that one. But you don't have to stay that way. 
realize that you are not your salva salvation. You are not the one that can save you. If you could, you wouldn't be in the mess you're in. Right? Amen. You got you there. But Jesus would love to get you out. All right. So we are, uh, uh, we are ready if you are ready. So who is the first victim? I mean, contestant. It's somewhere over here, Gunner. You decide. How far away? Okay, that's really far. Okay. Okay, so there's a verse in the Bible, and it is, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean out on your, on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. And what I struggle with is, like, you know, putting my full trust in him at in him with like every single thing in my life like not just some things like every single thing and I don't know how to like fully devote myself into putting my trust through everything or if do I trust through everything and in everything to him and just completely surrendering to him I guess uh, that's Proverbs chapter 3 I think it's verse 5 um, we nine. 5 and 6 uh, this is a normal uh, Christian disease I call it comp compartmentalism um and the ism is what makes it a disease you guys that would have been funny if you guys would have been paying attention <laughs> um what we do is we can here's the here's what's amazing to me and i really want you to chew on this the the average person sitting in this room right now you can trust Jesus, and I really honestly believe it. You can absolutely, completely, and fully trust Jesus with your eternity. Probably I wouldn't have to really honestly try to talk someone in here, in here to believe that they're actually really saved and that they're going to go to heaven and spend eternity with Jesus. But you can't trust Jesus with a cold. You can't trust Jesus with a tithe. You can't trust Jesus with 10% of your income, but you're going to trust Jesus with 100% of your eternity. <laughs> Did anybody else hear the quiet? It, it, it's radical to me. It is absolutely, it's, it's upside down that folks can trust Jesus with the eternity of their soul their spirit, and their resurrected body, but they can't trust him in the here and now with different things. It's because we compartmentalize stuff. We'll focus on certain areas of Christianity or certain areas of our belief, and we'll leave the rest of it just, well, you know, maybe the Lord will sort that. You know, he'll send me an angel or some pixie dust or, you know, somebody with some... Some great evangelist will come along in my life and just fix everything. Listen, if Jesus can't fix it, it can't get fixed. That's right. <laughs> if, if you didn't know that, you know, I'm sorry to shock you. But if Jesus can't fix it, if you're waiting for some super duper to come along or some revelation that you've never had or some scripture to jump off the page and slap you in the face twice and wake you up, if you're waiting for something from the outside to happen, then you are never going to truly have the revelation that on the inside of you is the solution to everything that ever could possibly be a part of your life. Yep. And that inside thing is Jesus Christ. Amen. And it is, I think it's insulting to Jesus to think that he lives on the inside of us. And to really honestly believe, and I honestly do, I believe that the majority of this room believes that they can trust him with eternity. But for him to sit right here, literally inches away from my heart, millimeters away from my heart, and for me to say, yes, I can trust you with heaven, but I can't trust you with money. For those of you that are married in here, you would not be married long if you did that to your spouse. And we do it to Jesus all the time. Your marriage would end in weeks, or if, if not days. If I said, okay, I can trust you with my sexuality and everything else, it's off the table. I'm going to have my own checking account. I'm going to sleep in my own house. I'm going to 
do my own thing. I'll call you or text you if I need you, but I'll completely trust you with my sexuality. I'm sure that would bless her little heart, wouldn't it? over here this could be better if you'd let me in but this thing over here there's there's a revelation I've got for you if you'd be willing to listen and so God is always speaking to us wanting us to together with him transform our lives to reflect Jesus but we don't want to listen You know, myself included, I have my moments. You know, just because I'm up here doesn't mean that I don't have things I need to work on. And so sometimes we have to be willing to hear what he's telling us, even though it might be hard, even though we don't want to hear it. Because if we are willing to step out and listen to him and trust him, it's going to revolutionize that area of our life. And it's just something that a lot of people are not willing to do because what he's asking of us is simple, but sometimes it's not easy. Getting rid of an old mindset is not easy, but it's simple because he makes it simple. And I'm just, I would say that that, that would be one of the, the things that maybe we as a body need to be aware of that sometimes we're not listening. I was just reading uh, this morning. I was just reading this morning <clears throat> in John chapter 3. We obviously we all know John 3:16. Um, and some of you are even uh, theologianish enough to know John 3:17. Um, but if you if you continue at some point you run out of brain space to memorize and that's why I would encourage most of you to not, almost, I would encourage everyone to not memorize scripture. I'd, en I'd encourage you to fall in love with Jesus and then every one of his words has impact. If there's one thing I hear from folks all the time, just wished I knew the Bible like you. I'm like, you don't have to know the Bible like me. You know Jesus and the Bible comes alive. Um, 3.18 says, he that believes on him is not condemned. But he that believes not is condemned already. And I used to believe that this was a statement like, if you don't believe in Jesus, you're condemned and going to hell. And if you do believe on, or you know what I'm saying, I think I said that wrong, but um, I actually started to realize that this wasn't talking about like just eternity, just life or death, heaven or hell. I actually started to see that there are places in our life that if we are not believing in, trusting, the word for belief um, in the Greek is, is pitho. Uh, it come, it's, the root word is pistis and pisteo. This is where the word faith, um, faithful, and trust. Pitho is trust. It's the root word of faith. You do not have your faith in God if you do not have it rooted in trust. You cannot believe in someone you can't trust. And there's a lot of folks in here, and, and I get it, that you can, you can believe things because you'll read them in the Bible or you're, someone will tell you and it'll make a bunch of sense to you. But where you actually trust God to bring those things to pass, my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Yeah, but I've been in lack before. And you let your experiences speak more loudly to you than the scripture does. And so you have faith because it's the Bible and you're not going to like 
go contrary to the Bible, but you don't actually trust the one that made the promise. Trust is super important. There's a condemnation that works on the inside of you not trusting God in there. And the devil will beat you over the head with it. Because he'll point it out. You don't trust God in this area. Wham, 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 wham. That's not God beating you over the head with that. God's saying, why won't you trust me? The devil says, you don't trust. You don't have any faith. You don't have, and he'll beat you over the head. But God will invite you in. He's knocking at the door of your heart. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world. Light is talking about revelation. It's not just talking about Jesus. It's talking about revelation. That there's revelation that's come into the world. And men.
You could be missing limbs and not let anybody know because your Facebook picture is awesome. <laughs> and you quote scriptures all the time on Facebook, and they've got pictures and, and amen and 47 likes. And on the inside, dying. It's not the way it should be, beloved. I would rather your Facebook be a mess and your soul be okay. It should be reversed. Posting dumb stuff on, about games on Facebook and your soul, you're completely connected to the Lord and, and, and everything is stupendous in your, in your spiritual life. <laughs> but it's honestly, it's the opposite because we, lo we love to hide behind the, the shadows of some of the things. We just don't want to deal with them. We kind of like quietly in our closet just hope that Jesus is going to work it all out. And that's really honestly the Lord wants it that way. He'd like to work it out. But if it's been a week or two or ten or a hundred and he ain't worked it out, I'm telling you that you've locked the door. And you're going to have to come to someone, to a person, to a man, to a woman that you trust. And you're going to say, I've locked the door to Jesus. Can you please help me how to show me how to unlock this? And we're going to bring a key out. There's keys to the kingdom. We're going to bring a key out. We're going to open a door. And Jesus is going to let the spirit of the Lord come rushing in, come rushing in, come rushing in. That, that verse in uh, Revelation chapter 4 where Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. You know, he wrote that to a church. We use that for, in fact, just the other day, I just heard it, an evangelist use that verse. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and many men will open the door, I will come in and I will sup with him. We use that as this evangelistic thing. You know, God wants to come in and come into your door and, and, and live in your house and eat with you. That is not an evangelistic scripture. He wrote that to the church. And we have entire denominations and entire groups of people, even in beloved church, that have locked the door to Jesus in some areas of their heart. And he is knocking and knocking and knocking and knocking. And I would encourage you to open the door. He is not going to hurt you. Never has, never will. Amen. All right, son. Who is next? Um, I have a question regarding Paul in the Bible speaking, you know, letting go of the former things and then moving forward to the new things. And in my study, where the, the former stuff is where the devil wants you, from kind of what I'm understanding, but the new thing, I mean, God's out here in the new thing, so how do you let go of that and be where God wants you to be? I am just really feel that the Lord wants me to have a better understanding of this or how to move forward with this? I'm not as easy. I don't pop off my easy answers as easy as you. Um, for me, revelation of how the kingdom works uh, you also need a revelation of who you are in Christ because you're not the old man anymore so you need a revelation of who am I in Christ who has God created me to be and um, both those things have to come from tearing out the old ways tearing out the old identity but you gotta replace it with a new identity there has to be um, a new way you see yourself. 
And that's where the word comes in because the word tells you exactly who you are, who that new man is, who God's created you to be. And revelation in that is going to go from, take you from the old man to the new man. Understanding it's all in the word. If you can't take out the old unless you've got something new to replace it with and you need to replace it with the word. So um, God's going to bring those scriptures to you. He's going to, if you ask him, he'll show you. He's not going to hold anything back from you. So if you, if there's something that you want to see, that you want to know, you want to repl- get rid of something, you got to have a scripture. you got to have a truth that's going to trump the old way or the old person. And God will give those scriptures to you. He'll show it to you. Um, <clears throat> there's a couple things. One is I really, really hate things like personality profile tests spiritual gifting tests, um, whatever, whatever language you have. I mean, there's literally dozens of them. Um, there's secular, there's, there's spiritual, blah, blah, blah. One of the reasons that I hate them is because, not that they're bad or they're wrong, because often it's actually kind of scary sometimes how right they are. But the problem is, is that it makes you believe something about you in a snapshot that is going to make you believe it for you the rest of your life. I was completely, fully, absolutely convinced when I was in Bible college that I was an evangelist because I led evangelical teams every weekend, twice a weekend, downtown Fort Worth, um, into the ghettos, around the Tandy Center, into the projects, and we would see, we would see the, as a minimum of somewhere around five and up to a hundred people born again, healed, baptized in the Holy Spirit, and I had dozens upon dozens upon dozens of people telling me, man, you are so anointed as an evangelist. So I was just absolutely convinced that I was an evangelist based upon what was going on in my life. But I knew prophetically from my mother and from what the, uh, the Spirit of God had told me that I was called to be a pastor. <laughs> so I had a struggle. I had a major struggle because I was seeing all this quote-unquote success evangelizing, but I knew I was called to be a pastor. You know what? It actually would hurt me. I would go and see 30, 40 people born again, and I would go home. We wouldn't get home till midnight, 1 o'clock in the morning, and I'd have to be, I was wrenching on cars back then in Bible college, and I'd have to be um, out the door by 7. And I would lay awake half the night thinking, what's going to happen to those people? I just led a bunch of people to Jesus. What's going to happen to them? Did I just birth a baby and leave it on the street to die? Are they going to die? And I'm like, Lord, please send someone that's pastoral (laughs) into their life. And obviously, after a while, I realized I was really, really pastoral. I was just doing the work of an evangelist because it was the opportunity that was presented to me. You can even miss God by believing in the former you. Even the godly former you. Look at this book of this verse again. It says, um, but this one thing I do, forget those things which are behind, and I reach forth into those things which are before. It doesn't say I forget those sins that are behind. I forget those bad behaviors. I forget those old ways of thinking in the carnal world. Paul is so aware of his new creation in Christ Jesus self that you will not find a place in the scriptures where Paul refers to his B.C. experience. There are zero places in anything that Paul ever wrote that refers back to who he was before Christ. This is Paul actually forgetting some of the things who he was in Christ. (laughs) This is probably a way new wrinkle in a bunch of people's brains. You know that testimony of that one thing that God did that one time 10 years ago that you cling to, that you are absolutely convinced is the the epitome of God's nature and character and his goodness in your life? You know that one thing that happened to you 10 years ago, that one good thing, that one testimony is literally holding you back? Because God doesn't want you to have a 10-year-old testimony. He wants you to have a 10-second-old testimony. And that's why these personality profilers and these spiritual profilers and spiritual gifting tests and all that kind of stuff, 
that they may have a value and I'm not, but the point is, is that if you ever take a snapshot of yourself and you put it up on the mirror, guess what you're always going to see? You are going to be convinced that that's who you are and that's who you're always going to be and this is my personality. I literally rebuked a pastor one time. <laughs> it was fun. Um, I rebuked a pastor one time because they told me, well, I'm just a type A personality. This is just the way that I am. And they were, they were excusing all the problems that they were making in their ministry because they were a type A personality. God didn't make them a type A personality to hurt people in their church. You can't just say, well, this is my personality, and then that gives you the excuse to go and trash a bunch of people, say, well, God made me this way. No, he didn't. The world made you that way, or you made you that way, or the devil made you that way. God didn't make you that way. Are you a type A personality, maybe as it relates to chasing your destiny? Yeah, good, go for it. God bless you, rip it. But you don't have permission from God to use your type A personality profiler to say that this is why I hurt a bunch of people. You you don't have permission from God to do that. You also don't have permission from God to say, hey, God, can you please show up like you did 10 years ago? If I went to Kay and I said, hey, can can we have it like we had it 10 years ago? (laughs) 10 years ago, we were still coming out of some stuff that I did. (laughs) We don't want it from 10 years ago. We've grown a lot. Don't do the Lord that way either. Don't do the Lord that way in your spiritual life. If you haven't had a testimony in 10 years, repent. And go get something fresh from the Lord. He's saying stuff to you right now, right here today. So in both ways, don't you dare let something from your past hold you back, good or bad, good or bad. The next verse says, I press towards the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Uh, Go to the King James if you can. It actually says it better. I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling. You you are not supposed to press towards my mark. You press towards your mark. And here's the thing. You don't press towards the prize. You press towards the mark. You know what the mark is? How should you end today? I know that I'm, the, I'm, a, I'm like the destiny preacher. You always hear me talking about destiny and your divine destiny and get your destiny and all that kind of stuff. But your destiny is comprised of 365 daily decisions for you to go towards the prize that is the end of your 120-year life where your destiny is fulfilled. If you try to get to the last day of year 120 tomorrow, you're going to kill you and everybody around you. But if you get one day closer to your divine destiny today, you press towards the mark for today that is on the trail of the prize that God has for you to have your destiny, you are going to be absolutely fulfilled every day of your life. You can go, you can lay your head down tonight and say, okay, I'm one day closer. I'm one day closer. But if you say, well, I need to be in completely in the full manifestation of my destiny, you're going to lay down every night and you're going to be basically condemned. Because I'm not in it. I'm not doing it. Well, of course you're not. What should you do today? Who are you presented with today? Who should you pray for today? Who should you lay hands on and see them recover today? Who should you testify to today? Jesus said tomorrow's got enough evil. Don't be thinking about tomorrow. There's sufficient evil for tomorrow. You concentrate right here. Now, do you need to know what the picture looks like? Do you need to have a vision on the inside of you? Yeah, write it down. Make it plain on papers. Habakkuk 2.4 says. Write it down so you can read it and run. But you're not trying to cross the mark. Only one time Paul referred to the fact that he actually crossed the finish line, and it wasn't very long after he passed away. The Bible calls it falling asleep. He fell asleep, went to be with Jesus. (laughs) But you can actually run your race. If anybody's ever been a long-distance runner, you know that you have to pace. 
You have to concentrate on every step. You have to count things. You have to get your breathing right. You have to get your footfalls right. You have to, there's something about it that's, if you use a sprint theology, which a lot of people do in Christianity, where you just run as hard as you can, you, basically you hit a wall, and then you can't sprint no more. It's a marathon that lasts your life. Get a good pace. Some days you might be a little quicker, making a personal best time, and some days you might need someone to come up alongside you and throw some Gatorade in your face. And I'll be happy to do it, trust me. Good at it. All right, uh, does that help, Jen? All right, praise God. All right, who's next? All right, so Keith Moore talks about um, how Jesus fulfilled the law, but all of the law was good and should still be followed today. So there's this kind of dynamic of everything God has said in the Old Testament is all good for us, which makes sense when it comes to like the Ten Commandments, you know, don't kill, steal, you know, all that stuff. Okay, that's logical to me. But there's 600 and some odd laws that I don't know all, and some are obviously just for that culture and not necessarily for the kingdom today but he, when he talks about that he, and it makes sense you know if God said it then it should still be good forever but how did he fulfill the law to the point where we don't ever have to do the law I don't know I'm just a little confused on that whole law thing uh, this is Romans 7 that she's talking about um, probably starting at about verse 10 and the commandment, uh, Romans 7.10, and the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. Was then that which is made death unto me, was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, the sin, by the commandment, might become exceedingly sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. And so what we, um, here's the thing. If you try to live by the law, you will slay yourself. Because the enemy will use the law in your life to kill you. Right. Nobody in here can keep it. And here's the thing. She's talking about 613 laws. That's the, the rabbinic um, theology is that there's approximately 613 laws. I've, I've actually heard differing opinions. But um, here's the other thing, too. You, you don't, there, there's also like a thousand laws that aren't in there that, you know, like don't, don't drink or cuss or chew or go with those that do. There's three more. They're not in the Bible. There ain't nothing in there about chewing tobacco. You can look. But you probably know that it's not right. At least your teeth know it's not right. You, <clears throat> the, God intended for, uh, for the law to show us what the standard was. This is God. This is how holy he is. This is how perfect he is. This is, if you're going to do it by merit, here you go. And what he expected everybody to do is say, oh my Lord, I'll never be able to do that. Lord, have mercy. And then he goes, ding, 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 ding. That's what I want you to do is I want you to know that I have mercy for you because I know that you can't keep this. And so I sent my son who kept it all, kept it perfectly. And now you have freedom because of what he did. And so now does the law not have any, any point or purpose or um, do we just chunk it all out? We all just float around in greasy grace and sloppy agape and just do whatever we want anytime we want because there's things that no longer exist because Jesus um, completely erased the Old Testament? No. Every jot, every tittle, it's going to be fulfilled. And the holiness that God was is the holiness that God is. God is holy, holy, holy. 
and will never cease from being that. And he, the scriptures actually say, Peter actually tells us that we are supposed to be holy as he is holy. Amen. So it is, it is um, well, let me say it this way. One of the reasons that I know that um, sexual dysfunction, fornication, all those kind of things are really, really, really bad and devastating in people's lives is because the law told me. You go read Leviticus chapter 18 and 19 and 20 and you see all the sexual dysfunction in there and the consequences to it and then it makes it clear why Paul would come along in the New Testament and say flee fornication. There's only two things that I know in the whole New Testament that you're supposed to flee. It's Satan and women. <laughs> it's fornication. It's what you're supposed to flee. Because it is a death trap. Right. It's not because Jesus didn't come and die on the cross and say, okay, now fornicate all you want. Yeah. Amen. You know that. We know that, but then we're like, yeah, but grace. <laughs> There's no yeah, but grace. Grace empowers you to live the holiness that God requires of you. If you're not shooting for the standard of God's holiness, what in the world are you shooting for? I hope it ain't to be like me. At least shoot for K. That's better than me. So the law is super, super important. But like Deborah said, that there are things that are obviously were types and shadows. Because if you come in here with your goat and you want me to kill your goat and put the fat on the incense and put flour on it and put oil on it and burn it on the altar, first off, we ain't got an altar. And if you bring your goat up in here, we're going to have a problem. <laughs> Amen. So there's things that obviously Jesus was typing shadow of. You know, one of the, I mean, it's in the Ten Commandments that you're supposed to honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. First of all, let me say this. For those of you that actually believe that you're supposed to do that, you probably don't even know when the Sabbath is. Right. <laughs> Most people think, well, that's Sunday. <laughs> no, it ain't. <laughs> the Sabbath is, never mind. It, it's not, it was never, it, the point of God making sure that people were drilled into understanding to how to keep the Sabbath and how holy it was and how we how responsible we needed to be to the Sabbath was because Jesus came along and he became our Sabbath. Amen. Jesus is our Sabbath rest. And so if you keep the commandment in the Ten Commandments to honor the Sabbath, which is not about a day, it's about a person, and if you honor Jesus and you keep him holy and you stay rested in Jesus, then you are keeping the law. It's the same thing with, like, sacrifices. If you are honoring what Jesus did for us as a blood sacrifice, if you're honoring what he did, then you don't have to go through all the figuring out whether you need two turtle doves or a bull and how you kill it. I mean, praise God, because I'm a Levite by the, by the Old Testament standard. Yeah. You, you know how much training I'd have to have to figure out how to cut up a, a carcass of an animal and put the fat of the lobe of the liver over here and... And, and do it just right. You know, there's, some of those folks died from doing it wrong. Right. Hey, talk about pressure. Yep. <laughs> All I got to do is preach a sermon. <laughs> some of those folks died for cutting up animals wrong. <laughs> Man, praise God that that's all done because Jesus was cut up right. By his stripes, we are healed. So you don't have to go through all that stuff. But I can go look at the law and I can see, you know, why the fat of the liver? What did Jesus do on the cross for me that represents the fat of the liver for that incense that was a sweet smell to God? You know, I don't know if you ever thought, why stripes on his back? Why is it that we're healed by the stripe? You know, you're not healed by his blood because people think that. You're not healed because he died on a cross. You're healed because he took stripes on your back. Why? Why? You know, the law will tell you. I'm not going to give you the answer. <laughs> the law will tell you why stripes, specifically it was stripes that needed to be done by him in order for you, because there, there's mangling, there's mutation, there's all these things that stripes have to do with 
that was required for him to do that in order for you to be healed. This is why it slaps me in the face when people don't believe in healing. Like, Jesus went through a horrendous part of the crucifixion just specifically for you to be healed, and you're going to spit on that or reject it? Dear Lord, why did he go to the cross naked? He was stark naked, y'all. He wasn't wearing a loincloth, and I don't care what Catholic church tells you the difference. He wasn't wearing a loincloth. He was naked. He had nothing. Nothing so much that they tore his beard out. For a man, that was one of the most humiliating things that you could have happen in those, in those days. They tore his beard out. His, his, his jaw bones were showing. He was stark naked. He was abused in his nakedness. I'm not going to go there, but they did that to him. Why did he have to be completely naked so much so that even humiliated by the loss of his beard? So that we could understand that it was for his poverty that we were made wealthy. And people that reject the quote-unquote prosperity gospel, you're rejecting an entire dynamic, an entire suffering that the Lord went through for you so that you would not have to suffer in poverty. He became absolutely destitute so much so that every disciple fled and his family disowned him he had no wealth of any kind in any way all the way down to the fact that his beard was torn out of his flesh so that you could say he was poor for me so i never have to be poor again so looking to the law i tell you i spent a lot of time in the old testament not to see how, what I need to do to live up to the standard of trying to be a good Levite. I'm already defiled as a Levite. I have broken bones. I, I have moles on my body. I have scars on my body. All those things defile me as a Levite. I would never be able to be a Levite. But I can also see that it was that in being a new kingdom priest and a new kingdom king, new kingdom king and priest, that it's not about those things. It's no longer about moles on my body. It's about me living, like a mole on the body shows that there's some kind of a flaw in your, in your appearance. You know what the New Testament parallel is? The New Testament parallel is avoid even the appearance of evil. So I shouldn't have a mole in the way that I, as a quote-unquote New Testament Levite, live my life in front of you, my congregation. Now, here's the cool thing. If I show a mole, you guys are a grace church. And you just chalk it up to Steve being weird. It doesn't give me permission to stay that way. I don't get to sit up here and say, well, this is my sin, and I'm just going to be this way and, and go on. No. God's holiness is supposed to burn anything out of me that's wood, hay, or stubble. Same thing with you. So the law is just and right and holy. And it is a very, very, very good reference to the purity, the righteousness, and the goodness of God. But it is a terrible standard to try to make yourself live by in order to be accepted and to be righteous and to be loved by God. We are accepted by God. We are righteous or just by God. And we are loved by God because of his righteousness, his holiness, his justness, his goodness, not because of ours. And even in the Old Testament, um, the people that stand out to you, uh, Joseph, David, uh, Abraham, these folks, they didn't do it by living by the law. They did it by living in faith and basically throwing themselves on the mercy of God. Does that help answer the question? So don't, don't just chunk the Old Testament because you've heard, like me and Dennis, preach on the law. The reason that we preach on the law is because the devil would use the law to beat you over the head with condemnation. That's not, that's not right. And not in the New Testament, it's not right. But the law is still right and just and good. And it's a great reference for us to use. And we should use it.
Yeah, Jesus said, uh, um, Mark, uh, I think it's Mark 14. He said that you fulfill the entire law and the prophets in these two things, loving God and loving your neighbor. Right. It is the fulfillment of the law. Now, there's a, there's a, a little bit of a dichotomy there. Um, one is, obviously, none of us can even live up to that. Does anybody love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength? I didn't say, does anybody want to? I said, is anybody doing it? Well, no, no hands are up. Now, if I said, does anybody want to, hopefully I'd get the whole church. Um, and is anybody, is anybody in here loving your neighbor the way that Jesus wants you to love your neighbor? <laughs> Amen. You, you might want to, you might desire, and you're pro hopefully you're better today than you were yesterday. But you're, you're not there, but Jesus did. Jesus loved God with all his heart, soul, mind, strength, body. Jesus loved his neighbor as himself and died for his neighbor. He fulfilled that. That's how he filled, fulfilled the entire law and all the prophets. Now, he's not asking you to do something he hasn't done. Everybody in this room, you know, one of the most irritating things that you'll ever have from leadership or management or supervisor is for somebody to come and boss you around and tell you to do something that they're not willing to do. God would never boss you around, ask you to do something he didn't do. He died for you. So for him to ask you to lay down your life for his, king, for his kingdom, to witness to people when it's awkward, to lay hands on the sick just because they're sick, not because you're awesome, He's not asking you to do anything he hasn't done. He was willing to be made a fool for you. Amen. It's okay to be foolish for him. All right. Probably one more. Look at how good of a pastor I am. Nobody has any questions. Oh, boy. Anybody else? <laughs> Anybody? Bueller? Bueller? There you go. I think he did this for me. <laughs> but Mom, you can talk. <laughs> and then give the mic back to Gunnar. But when I was young, and Stephen knows this, I was in a religion that was all law-based. And believe me, the people could not keep what they expected you to keep. And in the years to come, God brought this man in my life. And She's God, talking about me. <laughs> <laughs> and God said to me, he said, this is what I want from you, is to love Jim with my love. And I said, I can't do that. I don't know how. And he said, take my hand and I'll show you. Amen. This is what I believe God wants to do with each individual. Because our perception of love is not how God shows it or reveals it. And each one he reveals it to them in a different way because he made us, each one of us, different. I have learned so much through this about learning how to love God by loving him. And I cannot express how wonderful how beautiful Jesus is simply because he told me to take his hand and he would reveal his love to me. And that has blessed me. And that's the reason why 31 years of marriage, we've never had a crossword, we've never had an argument, we've never had a fight of any kind, period. I fought with you, but uh, <laughs> between me and her, 
It hasn't happened. And I'll tell you this, I learned so much about how to treat other people by simply sitting back and watching her. She's my example of what um, a godly person should be. And, and I thank God that we, we got together. I always said I, I, I wished I could marry a godly woman that, uh, you know, she brought some things along that I didn't. Uh. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we taught you a lot about the love of God, too. Um, you know, and one of the things that you have to, so when you hear, like, Mom talk about Jim, Jim talk about mom, me talk about Kay, Kay talk about me and these amazing things. Listen, it's not because we're lovely. I'm a, I'm hard to live with. And the reason I know that is because I'm hard to live with myself. Because I just do dumb things, say dumb things, think dumb things. She doesn't love me because I'm lovable or lovely. She loves me because it's a decision by her to love me. You know, if you make a decision to love someone, you know, like, a bunch of their stupidness just automatically disappears? Because love covers a multitude of sins. What's cool about these kind of things, and here's what I want you to get this about beloved, too, is you need to see the love of God with skin on. A lot of folks really, truly don't have a good relationship with Jesus because they kind of see the cross as kind of like this thing that happened 2,000 years ago to kind of a guy with some weird people in history and, and Roman soldiers and like this. It's so distant. It's so removed. There's not a whole lot of personal to it. The more personal that becomes to you, the more you put yourself at the foot of that cross, the more that blood spills on your face, the more you see the anguish, the demonic activity, the wickedness, the, the pain, the misery, the sorrow. He was rejected and despised. The more you see that, the more you come into that, man, the more you'll just adore him. The more you adore him, the less anybody will ever have to talk to you about some dumb thing in your life. You fall in love with Jesus and, and sins and bad thinking and, 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 and strongholds and, and soul problems and all that. The more you fall head over heels in love with him, that stuff just, it just, it naturally, it's right. effortless. Right. It falls off of you. I do not concentrate on trying to sin less. That's not my goal. My goal is not to sin less. It happens, but my goal is to love him more, to know him more. The more I know him is the more I love him. The more that I love him is the more I want to know him. The more I'm concentrating on knowing him, the less I'm concentrating on, you know, thinking bad thoughts towards my neighbor or doing some dumb something or playing some video game. If you love Jesus, you... Why would you ever want to, you know, a lot of the, the ha habitual things that people do in their life, it's to escape. If you think about it, addictions, drugs, alcohol, um, um, electronic addictions, it's real too, by the way, in case you think that it's just me harping on something. People are legitimately addicted to electronics. Um, the, those things are to escape. Your life is bad. How do you get out of your life? Well, you get drunk, or you get high, or you get into a fake world, an electronic world, and you go live there. You even, I mean, people even have their own names. They have electronic names and, and memes, or whatever, whatever they're called, the avatars. They have, they have avatars, and these avatars, thank you. These avatars are, <laughs> nobody thinks you're addicted. Um, these avatars, they literally take on the, they become who the person is. Here's the thing. I don't want to escape my life. My life's awesome. 
Jesus lives in my life. For me to escape my life and go somewhere else is to leave Jesus. Dear Lord, what an ignorant thing to do. <laughs> Why would I want to escape Jesus? That's the dumbest thing I could ever possibly want to do. If there's something in your life that's trying to pull you away from Jesus, I, here's what I would say. I wouldn't say, well, go fight against it and, and go attack that thing that's trying to pull you away from Jesus. Here's what I'd say to you. Why do you want to leave Jesus? How could something even come in and try to convince you? I had a dream. I'm going to end with this. I promise. I had a dream. I was just telling Kay this the other day. So I had a dream, and I haven't had a dream like this in years years. I was at a baseball game with a gal who was not my wife. And I knew in the dream that I was at a baseball game with someone who was not my wife. And it wasn't just because I just happened to be at a baseball game and there was a gal sitting there. Like, I went there with her. She was like my girlfriend. And I'm at a baseball game. It wasn't like some X-rated dream, you know, some... It was me at a baseball game with a woman that was not my wife. In the dream, I had this thing going off all the time in the dream, like, you're not with your wife, you're with some other girl. She was flirting with me. She was telling me all the things that guys love to hear, how awesome I am, and blah, blah, blah. And, and I just was like, ah, hon, thanks, you know. And it was in, and it was just, it was in my dream, it was gnawing at me. And this girl got up and whatever, and she went to the bathroom. And while she was in the bathroom, I said in the dream, why are you at a baseball game with someone that's not your wife? Why, are you, why do you even have a girlfriend? What kind of a person are you? And then, I, then my next thought was, wait a minute, I would never do this. This has to be a dream. Steve, wake up. And I woke up. And I was laying in bed, and I'm laying next to her, and I'm like, that's right. <laughs> and I said, now, since I've taken authority over my dream, I took authority. The, the dream Steve Castle took spiritual authority over the temptation in the dream to have whatever thoughts the enemy wanted to plant in my mind or thought process or whatever. The, the dream Steve Castle was, quote unquote, so holy that he woke up the dream Steve so that he could get back to reality, and I looked at my wife, and I said, okay, now since we're, since we're on a roll here, Lord, I'm going to go back to sleep, and I'm going to have prophetic dreams, I'm going to have dreams about my future, I'm going to have uh, dreams about visions of, of things that you have, I'm going to have revelation knowledge of scripture when I go back to bed. I went back to sleep, I had six or eight different dreams about revelatory things, vision things, prophetic things, woke up the next morning and said, hey, baby, guess what, I didn't dream about you last night, check this out. The, the, point of the, the point of what I'm getting to is you can actually train yourself so much in right. loving God and loving other people that you can even take authority over things in your dream life. Right. Right. You can do that. But sometimes we're so sin conscious or sin focused and we're just trying to, well, I just want to cuss less today than I did yesterday. Hey, you know what? You'll never cuss again another time the rest of your life if you realize that those words are literally stabbing Jesus with a spear. And if you love him so much that you would never really want to stab him with your words, it'll never come out of your mouth again. The last time I ever swore was 24 years ago in the front seat of my old Delta 88 in my sinner's prayer. It's the last time I ever swore. And I was so bad at swearing that I made my swearing friends uncomfortable around me. I invented ways to swear. It was sick, and it left me like that because I just felt I understood words, the power of words. When you, when you hear GD in a movie, you know why that is so terrible? Because God's not the dammer, and you've just called God Satan. Oh, it just it, it goes up my spine like a... Amen. Loving God will set you free from anything that could ever try to addict you. Amen? All right, that's it. Thanks for, thanks for hanging out with Kay and I. You want to bless them in any way? Say anything? I want you to bless me. Oh, Kay wants me to bless her.
it's easy to do. All right, uh, please, uh, please rise. Hold out your heart by holding out your hands. This is the universal sign of I'm ready to receive. I, it's kind of funny, I just ended with the power of your words. Now I'm going to speak words over you. These words have power. They have ability. Not mine, his. <laughs> but I've got the honor as the, as the minister in the room today. I have the honor of releasing it with his power and his heart into your life. And I want you to receive it. So don't, don't hear this from me. When you close your eyes and you open your hands, I want you to see the Father saying these things over you. He calls you beloved. The ones that are greatly loved. And he desires above all things that you prosper and you experience divine health as you allow your soul to experience that divine prosperity that Jesus purchased for you at the cross. I declare that this is taking place in your life right now, this second. And your life is changed today. And you're never going to be able to go back to what you were. But you're only going to be going forward into what he called you to be in the name of Jesus Christ. You receive that? Say amen. 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 All right.